Greetings and welcome to Word Magazine. This is Jeff Riddle. I'm the pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. In this episode of Word Magazine, I'm going to be doing a review of the debate that took place on February the 18th of 2023 between apologist James White and Pastor Thomas Ross, uh, an independent Baptist pastor from California, a debate that they had in Tennessee at a conference in Tennessee uh, on the topic of text and translation of scripture. It was supposed to have been a debate about the legacy standard Bible and the platform that that's built on, the modern critical text, the Nesalon, United Bible Society text versus uh, the authorized version and its basis upon the Texas Receptus. And so uh, Pastor Ross uh, defends uh, the uh, traditional text, the Texas Receptus, from a little bit different angle. He, I think, would identify himself as being on uh, somewhere on the spectrum of being a King James Version onlyist. And I wouldn't uh, use that language or talk about myself in that way because I'm approaching things from a uh, confessional reformed perspective, but there's a lot of common ground that I would have with him in defending the received text. So uh, anyways, this debate took place and I'd like to do a review of it. It was a long debate, two and a half hours. And uh, I'm actually um, in between two commitments right now. So I, I don't have a lot of time right now uh, to cover the entire debate. But uh, so maybe I should call this part one. This is going to be part one. I'll see if I can cover some of it. Um, but uh, let me just uh, pull up for just a second. Um, you can't see it yet, but the um, I'm looking at the YouTube channel, uh, KJB 1611, where the debate uh, is posted, one of the places that it's posted, because I want to look at what the debate topic was supposed to be. And so the debate topic was supposed to be, quote, the legacy standard Bible as a representative of modern English translations based upon the UBS, that's United Bible Societies, slash N.A., Nestle Alan, Greek text, is superior to the KJV, King James Bible, uh, as a representative of TR based, that's Texas Receptus or Received Text Bible translations. So uh, that was supposed to be um, the topic that they were debating. One of the things about this debate is they really didn't end up talking about the Legacy Standard Bible very much, but they focused instead mainly on modern critical text defended by James White versus the uh, TR uh, defended uh, by uh, Thomas Ross. And so uh, it was an interesting debate. I, I, I knew that it had not gone well for James White when I listened to his dividing line episode, the first episode after the debate had taken place. And I actually don't regularly listen to the dividing line but I knew that debate, the debate was taking place and I figured that he would probably say something about it. And so I did listen to his dividing line episode right after the debate. And I knew that things uh, had not gone well for him in the debate um, by the way in which he was trying to direct and program his fanboys uh, to listen to it. So he immediately started moaning and groaning about how, um, you know, Thomas Ross just threw out so much information. He was like a machine gun. Uh, you know, he was like a water faucet that was that was wide open with lots of information. And he had hundreds of slides that he put out there. And again, when I when I heard him giving those uh, kind of programming, this is the way you ought to listen to the debate. I figured that it probably had not gone very well for him. And when I sat down and listened to the debate, um, indeed, I uh, my takeaway from it was that James White did not do well in this debate. I think very much like the debate that I had with him, he didn't seem to be prepared. And also, he didn't seem to be able to think well on his feet. And 
Uh, he wasn't prepared for the 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 I think the level at which Thomas Ross pitched the arguments to him, not just the rapidity of them and the volume of the arguments, uh, the number of arguments he made, he made a lot of arguments, but it was the level of sophistication at which he pitched these arguments. There are a lot of things that Thomas Ross uh, threw at James White that it took him a while to even figure out what he was talking about, um, which is a little bit surprising given that uh, he is uh, a self described, you know, expert uh, in this field. So anyways, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, the debate. Again, it was held in Tennessee. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to pull up um, the PowerPoint, not the PowerPoint, uh, the video off YouTube uh, so that we can watch uh, the debate. And here they are. And uh, it's going to really be impossible for me to um, show all of this and comment on all of it. So I'm just going to give um, some uh, general comments at different points. And so we'll do some look-ins at the debate at, at, at several points. So I thought we would just start off with uh, James White's, um, some of his opening comments, because I thought the way that he began this debate was uh, was pretty interesting. So let me just go ahead and we'll start it here at about the 831 mark. All right. Well, good afternoon. I think this may be one of the earliest debates I've done in the day. Uh, and in fact, uh, congratulations, you all are in attendance at my 180th uh, moderated public debate. I had no idea in 1990 when I started debating Jerry Mattatix at a large Catholic church in uh, Long Beach, California, uh, that uh, that was going to lead me to Tullahoma. Yes. Uh... <laughs> well, let's just stop here. I just I thought it was interesting the way he began by congratulating the audience that they, that they had the honor to be present at his 180th uh public moderated debate and um kind of an interesting way to begin you know not i'm thankful to the lord i'm thankful that i've had this opportunity but i want to congratulate the audience because you had the privilege of, of, of getting to hear me participate in my 180th uh moderated debate and then it's kind of interesting how he um sort of says you know i started off in big auditoriums and now i'm in this little church in Tullahoma, Tennessee. Um, and uh, he's laughing about that, but I don't think he's real happy about uh, the smallness of the venue. But um, that really shouldn't matter, obviously, uh, to uh, the servants of the Lord. We sort of, we serve where we are. Uh, we're instant in season and out of season. But anyways, um, he uh, began the debate by laying out his points. And he did, I will give him credit, uh, he had uh, laid out in a PowerPoint three reasons that he said that um, you should prefer the, the the Legacy Standard Bible to the authorized version. He said, first of all, the Legacy Standard Bible is textually superior to the King James Version. Secondly, it is lexically superior. And then thirdly, it's translationally superior. So I do give him credit for laying out a framework uh, in this um, in these opening statements. Now, obviously, Thomas Ross didn't have this ahead of time. So in his opening statement and taking the negative, he's going to go in his own direction. And really, as far as uh, there being in this debate, a struggle for who set the tone and what talking points were going to be followed it was really Thomas Ross because there wasn't much talk about the Legacy Standard Bible. If if the if the if the main conversation had been about the Legacy Standard Bible, then James White's presentation would have set the tone or set the agenda. Um, but it was really Thomas w uh, Ross's response. I always want to call him Thomas Watson. He's not Thomas Watson the Puritan, but he's Thomas Ross. But I really think he set the tone uh, and set the agenda. Uh, for the debate. But anyways, uh, so White at least had these threefold. He was going to talk about how the Legacy Standard Bible is textually superior to the authorized version, lexically superior, 
and translationally superior. And let's go ahead and jump ahead to about the 16 minute or so mark when he gives three examples of why he thinks the uh, the Legacy Standard Bible is textually superior uh, to the authorized version, of course, which is based on the Texas Receptus. So let's move ahead to round about uh, 16, uh, right there. That'll be good. Now, in regards to the Old Testament, not so much. The 1525 Blomberg was used there, uh, and the current Bildi Hebraicus to Cartensia, they're very, very similar. There's very few differences between them as far as the Hebrew text is concerned. So he concedes that the Masoretic text uh, can be the standard. So he's not going to talk about the Old Testament. Actually, there are lots of issues that are going on right now with the Old Testament, uh, whether the Old Testament should be altered based on the Septuagint. We could talk about additions of half verses and verses in places like Psalm 145, 13. But uh, he tells us he's going to focus mainly on the New Testament. And James White offers uh, three examples of places where he says that the modern critical text is superior to the Textus Receptus. So here we go. But as far as the New Testament is concerned, uh, we have so much more access to so many more manuscripts today than they had at that time. And you must understand that the ability to know which manuscripts were which, to have a, a, a number designated to them, to know what they contain, where they are stored, that is very much a modern convenience that we have only had for a very short period of time. They did not have access to that kind of information that we have access to today and that the LSB translators certainly had access to uh, as well. We'll just pause here for a moment. You know, one of my um, criticisms of James White in this debate, when I said he wasn't prepared, is if you've listened much to James White, um, most of the material that he put forward in this opening presentation uh, are all sort of stump speech things. You've heard him say, if you've listened to him a thousand times, maybe a million times, and I, I really wondered, as he was going through this presentation, how many even of, of the people who are his ardent fanboys uh, are, are sort of getting bored of hearing the same things over and over and over? I guess there's always somebody new out there listening, but there wasn't really, there wasn't like the fruit of new research that was being presented on this topic uh, from James White. It's interesting, you know, for some reason, when I debated him, I got to choose one passage. I chose the ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9 through 20. And then he got to choose whatever passage he wanted. And he chose Ephesians 3, 9. And he went right back to that again in this debate. Um, I, I, as if he, I think he thinks he has some expertise on Ephesians 3, 9. He thinks it's a winner for him. Um, but anyways... Um, it's going to be Ephesians 3, 9, Revelation 16, 5, and 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Those are going to be his three examples. And, um, you know, you, you, sometimes you want to, why don't you just try something new? Why don't you try a, a new passage? Um, but anyways, he's going to talk about these three passages as examples of the supposed textual superiority of the modern critical text. So... Uh, as a result, the LSB represents more closely the words of the apostles themselves in many places. And for the sake of time, we'll look at only three of these examples. But I think if you write them down, I think they'll end up being a part of the conversation later on during the cross-examination. In Ephesians 3.9, the KJV follows Erasmus. And the King James translators had the five editions of Erasmus. Uh, they had Stephanus especially the 1550, uh, and they primarily relied especially upon uh, Bases 1598 uh, versions. They were not examining manuscripts. They were examining printed editions of the Greek New Testament. Well, actually, we don't really know that, do we? Um, these were very scholarly men, and we know that they did have access, actually, uh, to some early manuscripts. Uh, Codex Beza was there in uh, Bezai, rather, was there in Cambridge, and um, I think we shouldn't assume that they didn't have access to manuscripts. They may have had access to manuscripts that we no longer have, and by 
virtue of using printed editions, they had access to the manuscripts upon which those printed editions were based. Um, and they certainly had access to ancient versions. And so uh, he's trying to minimize um, the, the, uh, the, 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 I guess, the, the breadth of knowledge of the authorized version translators and scholars, basically, of the early modern period. Um, and I think we could certainly challenge that and say, in many ways, these early modern scholars maybe had more information and uh, more knowledge than modern men do today. Now, there were differences between all of those, and they made decisions between them, but they were primarily translating from printed editions to Greek New Testament at that particular point in time. And Erasmus, Desiderius Erasmus, the Dutch humanist scholar, uh, he was the first one to print and publish a Greek New Testament. It's actually a diglot, Latin, uh, Latin Greek. And he had had a very small number of manuscripts available to him. And he... We actually don't know definitively how many manuscripts he had available to him, but it only takes one accurate manuscript uh, to be able to put together a good printed edition of the New Testament. Um, sometimes having multitudes of manuscripts um, doesn't really improve your situation uh, necessarily. And uh, so I think it's a dictum in modern textual criticism that more manuscripts doesn't necessarily mean better manuscripts. But anyways, there's sort of, there's got to be a perfunctory um, uh, uh, effort to uh, downplay the accomplishment of Erasmus. Had access to a single one-off manuscript from around the 12th century, number 2817. That's its designation today. Actually, this is a this is a um, a conjecture. We really don't know uh, what manuscripts that are resources that Erasmus had access to. We knew that he had, we know that he had traveled all over Europe, um, and so James White is you know making some conjectures here. Uh, he would not be able to um, cite any source that would tell us definitively uh, which manuscripts that Erasmus has had access to uh, when he uh, produced his edition of the Book of Ephesians. That stands opposed to nearly the entire manuscript tradition of the Greek New Testament. So in Ephesians 3.9, the KJV reads fellowship, while the Greek manuscripts, Latin manuscripts, Coptic, Sahidic, Boharic, all other versions and all of the patristic citations read administration. Uh, that is the... Uh, well, not all the patristic citations, as I pointed out when I debated him, and he never seems to be willing to acknowledge it. We do have a citation of the Fellowship of the Mystery from Tertullian of Carthage uh, in that, that would date to the second century. Um, so uh, there is a patristic uh, reference to the... Uh, the, the rendering as it's found in the in the TR. Uh, the one manuscript, 2017, that Erasmus had, had koinonia, whereas everybody else has oikonomia. Now you say, well, they sound similar. Yeah, but they're very different, very different words, very different meanings uh, between the two of them. Now, Actually, they have a very close semantic um, um, connection to one another. They're within the same semantic range. Uh, dispensation or stewardship and fellowship or partnership, um, uh, oikonomia and koinonia. So, uh, in fact, uh, some people would argue that the words could be used interchangeably without changing significantly the sense of the passage. Now, this is a simple scribal error in a 12th century manuscript that, due to its use by Erasmus, became the textual reading of what is today called the Textus Receptus, the TR. But remember, that Textus Receptus that people have today, the small little blue case-bound edition published by the Trinitarian Bible Society, for example, uh, that Textus Receptus was actually created in the late 19th century by Scrivener. And how he did it is he looked at the King James. So he took all of, all of Erasmus and Stephanus and Beza, and when they differed, he looked at the King James translation to make make a Greek New Testament. So it's a Greek New Testament based upon English translation. 
Uh, that's a false statement. Scribner's edition is not a Greek New Testament based on an English translation. Um, he did uh, look at the authorized version and uh, he did compose a text that uh, would be the text that would reflect what the um, composers of the authorized version would have felt was the true text. But uh, the Scribner's Greek New Testament was composed in the way that Greek New Testaments were composed in the 19th century. And that is he compared all the, ex all the existing printed editions, some 18, I think, of them. And that's how he came up with his, he did not back translate from the King James Version into Greek, as uh, Dwayne Green once said, and as uh, James White implies, and I would encourage you to listen to the lecture that I did last year in 2022 at the Kep Pure and Old Ages Conference when I addressed uh, Scribner's Greek New Testament and I gave specific examples showing that there are many places actually in Scribner's Greek New Testament where uh, his printed Greek New Testament doesn't always match up exactly with the readings that are found in the authorized version. So it's not a Greek translation uh, that's uh, a Greek translation of the King James Version. He drew upon, again, the printed editions that were available in his day, and that's the standard that continued up into the middle 20th century is another point that I make in that presentation. That's the way Eberhard Nessel uh, composed his first edition, the Nessel Alan series in 1898, by comparing the existing printed editions and then composing uh, his edition based on that. And that's exactly what Scribner did. So anyways, um, uh, I, I think you'll be helped if you listen to my to my lecture that I did um, last year uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, that's that's what that's what we're talking about. When we talk about the text of Septim. So one manuscript has a reading in it, and it goes against all the other manuscripts that were much much older, and the sermons and the translations and everything, and yet that ended up because Erasmus was doing what he was doing, that ended up in the Textus Receptus, and that is the basis of the King James translation today. Now, as I pointed out in my debate with James White, the thing about it is, is we only have a handful of manuscripts that are earlier than the year 800. I think there are only like eight that are earlier than the year 800 that bear witness to Ephesians. And uh, al although, yes, all of those extant uh, um, manuscripts that we have that are earlier than the year 800 do read oikonomia. Um, we do have, again, one extant minuscule that reads koinonia. And again, it doesn't mean it was the only manuscript that read that. It's the only extant manuscript we have that reads that. We only have what we have. So, but the, but the larger point here is, and this is really going to be important for this debate, and this, this is the place where we could say that really James White lost this debate, was Thomas Ross is going to come up with an argument uh, to counter James White uh, that I think will be very germane to what he's, James White is saying here about Ephesians 3.9. What he's saying is you can't accept Ephesians, the, the TR reading of Ephesians 3.9 because it is a reading with the word koinonia that's only supported by one extant manuscript. Now there's an irony in this because actually there's another part in Ephesians 3.9 that's in the majority text that the modern critical text omits. James White has no problem in omitting what is the majority text reading with respect to part of Ephesians 3.9. But anyways, in this regard, he's saying Ephesians 3.9 and the TR can't be the right reading because it's only supported by one extant manuscript. And again, this is where Thomas Ross uh, puts forward an argument, I think that wins this debate for him. And it's it's interesting. I think the thing, the thing that was most surprising was that James White initially didn't understand Thomas Ross's argument and I think never really recovered and responded to it. But 
we'll see Ross puts forward the argument that actually in the Nestle Alain, in the modern critical text, there are many, many places where the modern critical text provides a reading that is not supported by any extant manuscripts. It cobbles together using its eclectic method, uh, a reading uh, in various phrases and sometimes in whole verses that you can't find in any extant manuscripts or maybe only in one or two extant manuscripts. And so he's gonna say, if this is your standard, then why don't you just accept the majority text? James White doesn't accept the majority text. Um, he accepts the modern eclectic text, which says sometimes you choose readings that aren't supported by the vast majority of manuscripts. If you're going to apply that as your standard in the Nestle Alain, uh, modern Greek uh, New Testament, why can't you accept that uh, for the TR? And with respect to the TR, uh, we just we just um, trust more the older Protestant scholars than we do modern critical scholars. Uh, we um, we accept the the, the text um, of the Protestant Reformation and not the one that's been put together by people like Westcott and Hort, Court Aland, and others uh, who don't hold to in many cases uh, Orthodox uh, theology. Uh, Orthodox Christian doctrine. So anyways, I'm just going to, for, for the sake of time, my time is short. Uh, I was going to listen to more of um, James White's presentations, aside from Ephesians 3.9, on Revelation 16.5, and on 1 John 5, 7, and 8. But I think I'm just going to skip ahead and I'm going to look at the second part of his argument. So he said the Legacy Standard Bible was textually superior uh, to the Texas Receptus, to, to the King James Version, which is based on the Texas Receptus. The second part of his argument was, he said it was lexically superior. I wrote down uh, times uh, signatures. He only spent one minute, uh, around one minute, from the 27 minutes to the 28 minute on that. And then his third argument is he said that the Legacy Standard Bible is translationally superior. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to skip ahead to the 30 minute mark where he's going to give, um, have to give it to him for symmetry. Uh, he said he's going to suggest there are some three examples where the, um, the authorized version is inferior uh, to the Legacy Standard Bible. And his three examples are going to be Acts chapter 5, verse 30, Titus 2.13, and Romans 9.5. So let's just listen in to a little bit of what he had to say about the supposed translational superiority of the Legacy Standard Bible. Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Think about what that's actually saying. Look at the LSB. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on a tree. The participle there is the means by which he was slain was by being hung upon a tree. They didn't kill him and then hang his body on a tree. The King James simply missed the translation of the participle. And so All right, let's just pause here. I, I just thought, again, this was a very... I thought all three of his examples here uh, were really not good examples. Um, you know, when, when, when you translate Greek, in all translations of Greek, um, I think if we have the time and we can go through the Legacy Standard Bible or the ESV or the NIV, any modern translation, we would find places where the translators have in Greek a, a finite verb along with a participle. And very often you can translate the the, the participle um, as uh, the the legacy standard Bible does here. You can translate um, the participle, um, uh, you know, as uh, re, re, uh, as reflecting um, uh, the cause or the means by which something happens, as it says uh, in the uh, legacy standard Bible whom you put to death by hanging him on a tree. So you can you can translate 
uh, the participle in that in that way and describe it as uh, you know um, a, a means by which something. But very often, what happens, uh, and I think. It's so often done in translations because it basically conveys uh, the sense that you have in uh, the original Greek is you have a finite verb, and then rather than putting another finite verb, they put a participle. And very often, the participles are simply translated as finite verbs, if, particularly if you have a series of things. And so um, I don't think that the authorized version here in any way, shape, or form has an inferior translation. Um, I, I, I thought, too, as he was going through this, I don't think that James White is familiar with the Protestant approach to text and translation as reflected in places like Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1 and paragraph 8, and the principle articulated by Francis Turretin uh, in his Alinctic theology in um, his discussions of the doctrine of scripture, when he talked about authoritas um, uh, divina duplex, the double authority of scripture. Whereas uh, the, the, in the original languages of Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament, there's a double authority of the scriptures in that they are infallible with respect to the content and they are infallible with respect to the words, the form. So they are materially uh, infallible and formally infallible. But with respect to translations, um, they, are, they are not um, formally infallible. They're not infallible with respect to the form, but with respect to the content. So in this case, if the authorized version properly conveys the meaning that's there behind the original language, then it, it, it is an acceptable translation. And I think both of the translations of this verse, I'm not saying the Legacy Standard Bible is a wrong translation either, but one of them uh, simply took the participle and translated it in English in a participial manner, Whereas the other took the same participle and I think appropriately uh, translated it as a finite verb. Um, so whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. And I think either translation is uh, correct in this case. So I thought that was not a good example. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I don't have other ones I would suggest to him. Um, because I wouldn't make the argument for the, uh, the for the translational inferiority of the authorized version. Um, anyways, let's look at his second example now. So you have to be able to admit, yeah, they missed the translation. The LSV is superior then, very clearly. One clear and compelling example is God, Titus 2.13. And this one's theologically important. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, LSV. Both terms, God and Savior, applying to the one person, Jesus Christ. It's called the Granville Sharp Instruction. KJV has, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That distinguishes between our great God and our Savior. It does not clearly communicate the fact that the underlying text is applying both God and Savior to Jesus. Now, there's a reason for well, let me, let me pull that back a little bit so you can see that on the screen. Um, so, again, I don't find this another compelling example. Um, he, he actually implies here that the authorized version reading is not affirming uh, full-throatedly the deity of Christ, and that's just not true. The authorized version, you can see the glorious appearing of the great God— and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the, the phrase, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, is in apposition to appearing of the great God, or really the great God. Who is the great God? The great God is our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is not saying there's God on one side and Jesus Christ on the other side, and they are, they are, two persons who are not equal in essence, uh, power and glory. 
not at all um, equalness is the same in power and glory. No, uh, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is in opposition to the great God. Now, he's saying that the, um, the pronoun our should be applied to both great God and, G and Savior. And yeah, I think that's, a, that's an okay translation as the LSB has it. Uh, appearing of the glory of our great God and implied our Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. And I'm not sure that that, um, that uh, I, I could uh, be a, a Jehovah's Witness and say, no, he meant to say our great God on one side as one entity and our Savior, Jesus Christ, on the other side is another entity. And um, that would be wrong, because I do think this is a full-throated affirmation of the deity of Christ. But same thing in, in the LSB translation. Our great God is on one side, and in opposition to it is and Savior, Jesus Christ. So both of them, I think, are affirming fully the deity of Christ. There is a question also as to whether the Granville Sharp construction applies here, because the, the noun God always has uh, or, or predominantly has the definite article with it and as um, um, a typical um, idiomatic way of writing the word God. And so I'm not sure the Granville Sharp construction here would apply given that God, Theos, typically has the article with it. But anyways, um, I, I just don't see this as a compelling. And the third example is even worse because uh, he's going to go to Romans 9.5. Let's look at that. Communicate the fact that the underlying text is applying both God and Savior to Jesus. Now, there's a reason for this. Granville Sharp didn't discover that rule until long after the King James was translated. That's where we've advanced in our understanding. So the LSB has a more accurate translation because of the continuation of our understanding of the underlying languages themselves. Another is found in Romans 9, 5. The LSB says, who are the, who, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is God over all, blessed forever, amen. King James says, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. That's different. That's saying Jesus is blessed by God. No, it is not. Again, it's truly amazing that he's saying this. Same thing. The authorized version, um, God bless forever, is in opposition to Christ. Uh, as concerning the, the flesh, Christ came. Christ, who is over all, he is God bless forever. So God bless forever is in opposition to the noun Christ. And that is the typical Orthodox way to read it. The, the, the reading in the Legacy Standard Bible is no improvement upon that. Um, uh, uh, from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is God overall blessed forever. Um, you, you know, again, I, I could play the Jehovah's Witness and say we've got Christ on one side and we've got the one who is blessed forever on the other. And um, and so it's not referring to Jesus as the as the blessed God or something like that. Actually, I think either translation affirms the deity of Christ. Christ and in both of them, God is in opposition to Christ. The problem is not with the authorized version. The problem is with the Revised Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version. And then the problem is also with many modern translations like the NIV that provide an alternative translation to that which is in the main text, where they put a period full stop after Christ, and then they put it like a prayer, God be blessed forever. That's the way the RSV did it. That's the way it appears in the footnotes of some modern translations. The, 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 the authorized version uh, here is giving a full-throated um, um, uh, affirmation of the fact that Christ is the God who is blessed forever, that, that Christ is the God of the Old Testament. He is the one uh, uh, God, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Um, <laughs> well, he's the second person of the Godhead. He is uh, the eternal son. Well, I'm looking at the time. I actually have another commitment that I made to, uh, that I need to get to. I was hoping I would at least uh, be able to get through James White's initial presentation, but it looks like I don't have time for that. And so I'm going to stop here. I think the main thing to grasp here from the beginning is that uh, James White is putting forward some arguments um, on the text and on translation. I think particularly what he says about the text and what he says about Ephesians 3, 9, that we can't have a text that's only based on one extant manuscript. That is that is going to come back to hurt him in this debate because Thomas Ross is going to show him places in the Nestle Alon text, uh, runs of phrases and even whole verses that we don't have any extant manuscripts that match up with exactly as how it reads. And James White seemed uh, not to understand the argument. I think by the end, maybe he was getting it, um, but uh, and he really didn't have an answer for it. So anyways, we'll bring this to a close for right now. This is part one. And God willing, I'll come back and uh, we'll continue the discussion on uh, reviewing the debate between James White and Thomas Ross. Till the next time we meet on Word Magazine, take care and may the Lord richly bless you.